Scripture reading is from Proverbs 22, verses 1 through 6. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Humility is the fear of the Lord. It's Wages are riches and honor and life. In the paths of the wicked are snares and pitfalls, but those who would preserve their life stay far from them. Start children off in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Please bow with me in prayer. Father God, we come before you this day and we give you praise and thanks for who you are. We thank you that you are God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the source of all life. We thank you, God, that you are all-knowing, that you are all-powerful, that you are gracious and good, that you are righteous and holy. But on this day, God, we also thank you that we can call you Father. We thank you, God, that we can enter into a personal relationship with you made possible through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that we can know you not just as the creator and sustainer of life, but we can know you as Papa, as the one that we come running to, as the one who provides for our every need, who watches over us and cares for us throughout life, who has made provision for us in this life and throughout eternity, one who has sacrificed immensely for us. And Lord, we thank you for those wonderful examples of fathers that we have been blessed with. And Lord, we pray that as fathers, we might provide good examples for that next generation, that as the choir sang, that we might be found faithful, that there might be a legacy passed on. And Lord, as we look at your word this day and we consider what you have for us regarding instructing the next generation, I pray that we, we would be encouraged where we need to be. We would be challenged where we need to be. We would be corrected where we need to be. And that your Holy Spirit would speak to each heart and each mind and that you would draw us all closer to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. We have been doing a study in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs being wisdom literature, and I entitled this series Wisdom for Living, and we kind of jumped uh, ahead a number of chapters to jump into uh, Proverbs chapter 22 because uh, verse 6 of chapter 22 that David read is, I think, kind of the quintessential of parenting. It, it is... Uh, uh, a reminder of what we set out to do uh, as parents. And I want to just remind us before we uh, look at the passage and kind of break it down that uh, this is a proverb. I know that we, we hold on to this verse that we should train up the child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. But it is a principle, okay? It's a proverb. And as Proverbs, uh, God, God says he's, he's, made, he's made a pattern, he's made a, a certain way in which life works. And if we follow him, generally it goes this way. But we live in a broken, fallen world that's been greatly impacted by sin. And we need to remember that even as we read this scripture, that we can do the right things sometimes and the results still don't come out the way one would want because there is this thing as free will. And you and I can be good parents and our children can still choose to be wayward. 
So I, I say that before we jump into this because I don't want parents beating themselves up because their kids aren't exactly where they ought to be in their relationship to God. But the Word of God does give us counsel and direction on how we should lead that next generation. And really, uh, there's a reminder here that life is really a classroom, that you and I are always to be learning and growing, and uh, even as parents, we need to be growing and understanding what we're called to do. And there's three things in this passage that deal with parenting, and I started them all with the letter A so that you get an A as a parent uh, in that classroom. And the first one is the age of parenting, okay? It says, train up a child. Uh, that word in Hebrew used for child refers to a specific age. It's refer referring from infancy through adolescence. Now, parents, that does not mean that once your kids reach adolescence that you can kick back and say you have arrived. Don't say like the dad, you're 16 and you know everything. No, you just think you know everything. You, 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 you still need more training. But um, that word related to really their culture because by the time you got to be pretty much an adolescent back in the Bible times like that, you were getting married. You were starting a household of your own. That's not the same in our culture, but the goal really is, the, the whole idea of this age of parenting is our responsibility is to equip them to get ready to live on their own, to be able to... Uh, to deal with life on their own. Um, and there's something very important about those formative years of life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse uh, 1, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. He's getting to the end of his book, and he's saying, man, it's really important that we come to faith in God early in our life so that we can enjoy, actually, the presence of God in our life and see his movement and work in our life. Now, God will save anyone, and he's delighted to save anyone, even if they're on their deathbed. But a wonderful thing is a life that is surrendered from early on throughout their life uh, to the living God and how God can use that kind of life in a mighty way. Uh, an example of this is, in the Old Testament is Moses. Um, think about this. We know the story of Moses. Moses, uh, he, he's, he's a Hebrew. He's born into a family. Pharaoh has said all the baby boys have to be killed. His mom and dad keep him uh, as long as they can until, you know, uh, they're going to end up getting caught. And so she puts him in a basket and puts him in the Nile River. And his older sister Miriam, she watches to see what happens. And the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, sees this little baby in that basket. And she knows he's a Hebrew baby, but she takes him in and she decides to raise him as her own. But his big sister says, hey, do you need somebody to nurse that baby? Yes, I do. And so she gets his mom to take care of of Moses. And back in those days, nursing would be two to three years. So mom is taking care of Moses. What kind of impact can you have in those first two to three years? A great deal of impact. A great deal because we know it. We're not told what she teaches. We're not told how she nurtures this little guy. But we know this. When he becomes an adult, in spite of the fact that he grew up in the palace of Pharaoh, in spite of the fact that he was taught all about those false gods, that he had access to the library of Egypt and was trained in all of the knowledge of the Egyptian culture, when it came time that he was an adult and he saw the Egyptians we beating and whipping the Hebrews, he identified himself with the Hebrew people. 
at the core of his being, he says, those are my people. Why? Because mom instilled that in him. Because those formative years were very important. Psychologists today tell us that the first five years of life are, are very, very influential in our lives. It helps us understand what the world is like. It helps us either to trust or not trust. It helps us to have self-esteem and confidence in all the ways in which we approach life. Much of it is happens before we get to school. So that means moms and dads are vital for the well-being of that next generation. And some of that informal education that happens just in the house is so very, very important. So there's an age of parenting. Then there's an art to parenting. Um, there's not just a standard book, is there? You can't just go get a book and go, okay, if I follow this book perfectly, then uh, it, like a factory, the, the, the end result will be just what we want. No, there is an art to it because you're dealing with human beings, right? And we're all a little bit different. Again, the scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go. Um, that training up, uh, it it involves a couple of things. First, it, it means to initiate the child in accordance with his way. It's really uh, referring almost to apprenticeship-like. It, it, you're, you're, you're to train them up in uh, the things that they need uh, for life. Uh, back in Bible times, that was a very appropriate, actually, for work, uh, which is a part of this because according to to train them up in the way they should go according to his or her calling or station. Um, back in those days, if dad was a carpenter, you'd be a carpenter. If dad was a mason, you'd be a mason. If, if wh Whatever dad's career is, if dad was a rabbi, then son would be a rabbi. They, they would be trained in the skills and the jobs that, that, that father had. Um, but there's more to it than that. It's also being trained in who you are as a person. David, when he began reading the Scripture to us, I had him read the first six verses. And verse 1 of chapter 22 says, A good man is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. In other words, to instill within your children the understanding that how you live has great value and you should live an upright life and I will be a good example of that. That's vital. Uh, where Melinda and I lived before, we were not too far from uh, Kentucky Christian College, a university in Grayson, uh, Kentucky, and the college uh, basketball coach said this every time uh, to his players before a game or whenever they got on the bus to go to an away game, he would say, remember who you are and whose you are. I love that. Remember who you are and whose you are. He, he went on to explain that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you represent him and his kingdom. So on the court or off the court, your conduct is important. What you say, how you respond, what you do matters. Not just for that moment, but for eternity. Because you're a witness, either a good one or a bad one. And as parents, we need to train our children to understand there's a calling in life. There's, there's, there's value in how we live. And the second part of that is, and according to his or her character. I need to go back. I haven't done character yet. Um, character uh, that, or that vocational inclination. That really means that uh, as moms and dads, we need to know our kids. 
we need to study them to kind of know what makes them tick and how they work so that we can help steer them and direct them. There are a few psychologists uh, that will tell you that children are a blank slate. They're crazy. Anybody who's had children know that they arrive to us with their own little personalities, don't they? And you kind of need to learn how they work. Um, I, I, I love a wise uh, father once told me, he said, you don't, you don't treat your children equally, you treat them equitably. He went on to explain. He said, you cannot treat each of your children exactly the same because they're not the same kind of people. So you have to learn what makes them work and how they operate so that you can lead them in the right direction. I pick on Justin and Emily a lot, so I will use myself and my brother for an example here. And, um, uh, and we, we just have different makeups. We, he, he's, a, he's a great man, but he started off a little rough um, because uh, between my brother and I, my parents... All they had to do was tell me, I'm disappointed in you. And that crushed me. I never wanted to disappoint my parents. So that's pretty much it. And I'd fall in line. My brother, not so much. Um, corporal punishment, that didn't hurt. Um, they finally learned that they had to take privileges away, and that would help line him up uh, because that's the only thing that worked there. You have to, uh, it, there's an art to guiding the character of your child uh, by studying them, by knowing them, by learning about them. Um, and then that training also involves uh, demonstration, that's by example, education, and correction. I had, a, uh, I had an education professor who told us regularly in class, children, uh, as far as training goes, that more is caught than taught. And what she meant by that is they catch what you do. They watch what you do. They see what we do, and they either pattern after that or they reject that, but it, 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 it's caught. Uh, today, uh, Bill and Linda Bennett are here with their family celebrating their 50 years of marriage. Yeah. <laughs> that is an example. That, that, is, that, that, is, that is something that blesses not just them, but the generations that follow. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful thing about being committed to one another and your children experiencing that, your grandchildren experiencing that, witnessing that and seeing a faithful couple who love each other and love the Lord. That, that, that should be the goal. That's an awesome thing. Um, we also can have bad examples where our words don't match up with our actions. And that can be dangerous. Um, when I was in Ironton, there was a time in which the school board approached the ministers within the community because they were having a terrible truancy problem. And no matter what efforts they made, they didn't seem to be making corrections. And they actually trusted the clergy enough that they asked for our counsel and maybe our assistance. And we uh, suggested a program that we could do uh, after school. It was written by Josh McDowell. It's entitled Truth Matters. And it was basically simply moral teaching, how to teach kids moral principles and to do the right thing. And I can remember in this small group that I had of sixth grade uh, kids, predominantly boys in the group, um, the lesson was on telling the truth. And I just asked, do you ever lie? And one guy immediately said, oh, yeah, I lie. 
And I, I said, well, when do you lie? Expecting that he would tell me, well, to get out of trouble or to get to do what I want to do. And he said, I lie for my dad. I really didn't know what to do with that. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, whenever uh, the phone rings, dad will have me answer it. And if it's somebody from work, he will say, tell them I'm not here. Now, I'm sure that that dad's goal was not to teach his son to be a liar. But he was teaching his son to be a liar. Because his actions and his words weren't matching up. More is caught than taught. That next generation is always watching you and me. So it's real important that we live consistently in what we believe and what we say we believe. So there's an age of parenting, there's an art of parenting, and also there's an aim of parenting. We have a goal that we should be shooting for. Train up a child in the way he should go. There is a way that we should go. Um, when uh, Justin was born, I received a gift. It's a little book on being a father, and there were lessons in there on how to teach your child to uh, ride a bike, how to teach him how to go fishing, how to uh, uh, toss and catch a ball. I did, went through all these basic things. Anyway, it was a good practical book. And there are a lot of things that we do as dads with our kids to train them uh, about life. But there is one thing that would be the ultimate tragedy that you and I, if we fail to do this, we've ultimately failed miserably. If we fail to train them to know that there is a God in heaven who loves them and sent his son Jesus to pay the price for their sin so that they can be forgiven and have everlasting life in heaven. The greatest tragedy that could ever happen to any parent is to not have their child in heaven with them. That would be the ultimate worst thing that could ever happen as a parent. Do you agree with me? And so it is vitally important that we aim in our parenting to direct our children, our grandchildren, that next generation to the Lord Jesus Christ because there is a way of salvation. I probably quote this verse on average two or three times a month, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. And the beauty of what Jesus said is, you look at all other religions, and all other religions will tell you there's a God, and you kind of got to work your way to him. And Jesus said, I'm the way. You come to me, and I will get you to my dad. I will get you to the Father. I will take you there with me. And that's exactly what he did. We go, we will only go to heaven on the trail behind our Savior who already blazed the way. We're on his coattails. We're on his righteousness. We go because he did it for us. And it's by faith in him. And there is this way to salvation that is vital that you and I pass on to our children. Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy, his, his spiritual son in the faith, he wrote to him in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, speaking about his mom and grandmother who schooled him in Scripture. He said that from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. And I won't leave out moms here. Moms and dads, we need to bring the Scriptures to our kids. We need to continue to show them the truth of the Word of God. 
And we need to stand on that word ourselves so that they not only hear it, but they see it applied in our lives. That God is real and that he matters and that he's changed my life and he can change yours. So there is a way of salvation. There's also a way of satisfaction. That's also an aim for us as parents. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, God's Word tells us that we are God's workmanship created for good works in Christ Jesus that God had prepared in advance for us to do. There is a sense of satisfaction, is there not, when you can do something that you know you're good at? And, and there's just this sense of, I, I, I'm doing what I was meant to do. One of my, my all-time favorite quotes related to this is, is about Eric Little, who was the Olympic runner for England, participated in the Olympics. Chariots of Fire was a movie made about his life. And his sister, though he knew he was called to mission work and he ultimately became a missionary to China, his sister did not understand this running thing at all. She just did not get why he wanted to run. And one day he told her, he said, he said, God made me to run fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. I love that. I feel God's pleasure. I'm doing what God meant me to do. And I can feel it. There is a sweet spot in life when you and I are doing what God meant us to do. And parents, we need to as best we possibly can, steer our kids in that direction and help them understand that there's purpose in life. And they will be most fulfilled when they're following after the purpose that God has for them. So there's a way of salvation, there's a way of satisfaction, and lastly, there's a way of service as well. At the very end of Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes, he sums it all up and he says, in conclusion, fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. He says, when you look at everything, when you evaluate everything in life, this is what it all boils down to. Love God and serve him. Love God and serve him. Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, when he was confronted with the devil and the devil was tempting him, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy and he said, get behind me, Satan. Uh, you, you need to serve God and God only. That was Jesus. Serve God and God only. And we need to Train that next generation to serve the Lord, to serve him and put him first. In conclusion, I'll just uh, put up a quote. It's probably one of my favorites as far as relating to parenting. And it simply says, one day they'll walk in your shoes. Make sure they're pointed in the right direction. Bow with me in prayer, would you? Lord God, thank you for the blessing of family. Thank you for the wonderful way in which you preordained for us to be able to be in relationship to one another. And Lord, we both thank you for the awesome responsibility of parenting, but we pray for your wisdom and your grace in doing so. Because we know ultimately that's, that's a job that has huge and eternal consequences. And so, Lord, I pray for every dad and mom here this day that you would help all of us to live consistently for you and to point our children and our grandchildren in the direction that they should go to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I, I, I pray for those who are not yet moms and dads. 
that they are forming within themselves the desire to seek after you, to live in a godly relationship with you, that they will be well equipped and ready for the challenges that lie ahead in parenting. And God, I pray for this church family that we might be a household of faith that nurtures families, that provides godly counsel and support, that families can come here with a sense that this is a refuge from a world that is very caustic at times. And I pray that this would be a place of refreshment and strength and encouragement and challenge. Most of all, God, I thank you for your grace that abounds our failures, that conquers our weaknesses, and that can overcome our sin. And so, Lord, we pray your blessings upon us, and we ask for your continued guidance and direction. We pray in the powerful and loving name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our closing hymn is Happy is our, the Home When God is There. And as we stand and sing, I extend this invitation. The altar is open to anyone who, uh, through God's uh, calling, wants to profess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe God's calling you to rededicate your life. Maybe the Lord is leading you to say, this is the church family where I need to partner to be a part of. Um, you respond as the Lord is leading as we stand and sing together. <laughs>